but I think we should go ahead and get started because we have got an action-packed session. This is our largest session of the entire forum. We have so many voices that we're going to be hearing from today um, in the next hour. And so I want to just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Beth Baser. I am the Executive Director of Schools That Can Chicago, and I'm very excited to welcome you to What School Without School? So um, as we have been thinking over the past several months about how to transition our national forum into a virtual forum and thinking about the ways that we're responding to educational issues in the time of COVID-19, my great friend Seth Lavin wrote this wonderful column in the Chicago Sun-Times called, What is School Without a School? And I'm adding a link to that column here in the chat box. And initially, I thought this column was going to be a very different thing, but it turned out to really be a very emotional piece about how we connect with our school communities and how we, um, how we as school leaders and bring our communities together. And this got me thinking about really what I think is front of mind for so many of us who either work in schools or work with schools, uh, which is how do we connect with students and with families? How do school leaders do it? How do teachers do it? Um, how do we keep academics at the front of the work that we're doing at a time when we don't have our students in front of us and when everything has changed and they're dealing with um, issues that they've never dealt with before. And that is how this session began to come together and began to coalesce. And uh, immediately I thought, well, who would we ask to moderate such a session? And I could not think of any organization but CASEL. So for those of you who are not already familiar with CASEL, um, CASEL is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Um, it's an organization that really gave birth to the field of social-emotional learning more than two decades ago and continues to work to facilitate and promote the adoption and implementation of systemic, high-quality, integrated social-emotional and academic learning. And I was so lucky to be connected with the wonderful Karen Van Osdel. And uh, Karen is uh, joining me here in, in sunshine yellow, um, who is the senior director of practice and who graciously agreed to moderate our panel today. Um, Karen Van Osdel joined Castle in 2016 as the senior director of practice, supporting districts across the country to integrate. Let me turn off my printer. I'm sorry, that's being very noisy. Um, uh, joined Castle in 2016 as the senior director of practice, supporting districts across the country to integrate social into their systemic practices. Prior to that role, she served as the founding executive director for the Office of Social and Emotional Learning for Chicago Public Schools. Karen started her career as an elementary school leader in the Washington, D.C. area. At home in Chicago, she also works on nourishing the social and emotional learning skills of her own two school-aged children. So, um, Karen, why don't you take a moment and, and expound on yourself and the work of CASEL before we start with our panel conversation. Great, thank you so much, Beth, and thrilled to be here, thrilled to have just time to talk with the panelists and to be part of this wonderful summit. I was able to join yesterday and just such incredible conversation and insights that has definitely left me thinking overnight as well. So thank you for having me. Um, just a word about Castle. So I best share some of the history and I think Castle now in my work at Castle, we I work very closely with large urban districts and some small and mid-sized districts across the country who are really trying to embed social emotional learning into everything that they do. So that means from the way they hire new team members, to the way their transportation department runs, to the way teaching and learning happening, how are we including social emotional learning in all of those foundational aspects of a school district and of a school and of a classroom and of our connection to community and parents and families. So I think um, this conversation is gonna touch on a lot of those areas. And I think Beth will also share 
CASEL just put out some guidance for districts and schools that are working to think about how that integration of social emotional learning can happen as we think about planning for next year and for the summer. So Beth will share that with you in case that is helpful in your work. Um, and I look forward right here to- here in the chat now. Well, thank you, Beth. Um, and I look forward to diving into our conversation. So I think we're gonna start by welcoming our parents and our students who are with us today. So if you all can enter the room, that would be great. Yes, yeah, so I'm very excited. The first uh, portion of our conversation will be taking place with two students and two parents. So as I introduce you, please give us a wave. We have Stephanie Quintana for, and Nicole Aguirre Medina from Josephine Academy of the Sacred Heart here in Chicago. And we have Dina Pelios, parent coordinator, and Diana Limongi, parent from PS17 Henry David Thoreau School in New York City. So um, would all four of you please join us on stage? Hello. Hi, Dina. Am I supposed to be here? Perfect. Yep. Oh, I didn't know how to get somebody actually sent me a message to get in. So you did great. Hey, Nicole. Hi, 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 Nicole. Hi,
I think another one, the most recent one right now, I believe was the exercising one. Oh, and then things that we were grateful for. We also did that in our college prep class. Love it, Nicole. Thank you. Well, we'll come back to you. Um, okay. Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself and just share a little bit about how these last few weeks have been for you? Hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm a senior at Josephine Academy of the Sacred Heart. Uh, for me personally, um, on Schoology, we have discussion boards, and mm -hmm. usually you have to reply to a peer's comment three times. So, like, sometimes it's like a thread almost like a Twitter thread and I'm able to see what other people are doing and I get to comment and then we stay connected like that. And then also uh, for literature, sometimes my teacher does Zoom meetings every week. So it's about like an hour long and we can talk personally like anything about college, um, what we're doing. And then for my art class, sometimes the teacher wants us to join hangouts and then we just text each other and talk about what we've been doing lately. So it's been fun. Great examples. Thank you, Stephanie. I will come back to you as well. Um, Diana, would you like to introduce yourself and share from a parent's perspective, how have these past few months been for you and how are you staying connected to your school community? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so my name is Diana Lamangi, and I am in Queens, New York. I am um, part of the PS17 community. Um, shout out to my beautiful parent coordinator who's on the panel with me, Dina. Um, so I agree with Nicole. That is exactly how I describe it. It's emotional roller coaster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a PTA member, we started one week with how do we talk about this? We don't want to alarm parents. Mm -hmm. That was on like Monday. And then Thursday night, it was like, everything is shutting down, mm -hmm. you know, and that is it. You're not going back to school. Um, so, you know, everything went by really fast. Um, we have been trying to, you know, leverage social media, but also really check on families. I think our teachers and our parent coordinator and administrators have done a really good job of really trying to make sure that all our families have just the basic needs like there are a lot of families who are suffering from food insecurity in our communities a lot of parents who lost their jobs um a lot of people who needed um tablets and ipads so the doe here in new york has been providing that so it's been a lot of moving parts. So as um, a PTA member, we're just trying to provide information, but also a little bit of levity, you know, like we'll share resources, but also like funny memes or videos um, in our kind of Facebook group where we try to engage everyone. Um, but, you know, it, it's hard. And I think it's important to talk about the fact that it's hard and that it's not easy every single day. You know, there are days when I'm like, woohoo, I got this. And there are days when I'm like, oh, I don't. Um, and I think that that is absolutely human. Um, I think our kids feel it too. I have a third grader and he loves the, he loves that sometimes he's done early and he's like, woohoo, I'm done. Mm -hmm. But then like he also, the last few days in particular have been hard. He's like, I miss my friends. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, so you know, every day is uh, an adventure. And I think that we just have to take it day by day. Thank you, Diana. Yeah, I have a third grader too. And definitely you may, she may come in at some point, right? So yeah, absolutely, <laughs> that's, that's the reality. Um, Dina, I would love to hear about you because I know you have a role where you're interacting with a number of parents. So I'd love to hear sort of what you're, hearing from your parents in your community and sort of how you're working to stay connected with that community and it sounds like diana is part of that process as well she is she is she's a big part um so i just want to introduce myself i'm Thank dina you. pelios the parent coordinator at ps17 in queens i've been there i want to say it feels like 20 years but maybe it's 16. um the community is so diverse and amazing. And this whole process has been, you said roller coaster. For for myself as a parent coordinator, keeping in touch with the parents and their needs was priority for us. Like we just jumped right into crisis mode um, in the beginning. 
But as a team, as a school with the parents, principal, assistant principal, we have such an amazing team that I feel like everyone just, what are we gonna do? Tack it on, take care of the parents first, their needs, um, make sure that we had a way they can reach us at all times, phone call, um, just a phone call away. Cause sometimes email, it's nice to know that you can call someone. It keeps that sense of stability. Mm -hmm. um, but working with the families, um, communication and outreach is our mm -hmm. number one. Yeah. No, no, number one. And I feel like we've done such an amazing job with PTA has done such an amazing job. The parents, the SL team, our crisis team with making sure that um, Facebook, through social media, that's why I love our PTA. Mm -hmm. They're so amazing with outreach. Um, really great way. So I think we were able to get in touch with our families right away, make sure they have everything that they need, know that um, priority is their health and well being first. And with that comes the education. And then we tied in so much fun activities for the kids with our spirit team, the videos. Um, each week, it was just another project to have the children engaged and giving them something to look forward to. So yes, they're not going to school and their friends. However, um, dress up in your uniform today. And they would just maybe send a picture. We're doing a virtual cookbook, which we're so excited about, um, which is really amazing. Um, just stay, staying in touch. Yeah. The most important thing is keeping that communication open. And I know for the parents, um, our biggest struggles were technology. Sure. So making sure that everyone had technology because our community is so diverse and there's many different languages within our community. The first thing was making sure that we were able to have translators in place when we needed them. Um, Again, parents would even help out just to make sure that we're reaching all our families. Right. But once they have their devices and they're able to log on, assisting them with schoolwork, but knowing and making sure that their health is number one. We, I feel like we are very lucky in this district, our district, um, our community, just everything. There, we have so many more resources available, I feel like, during this crisis that um, I would go through them and say, okay, we have so much to give the parents. It's probably mm -hmm. too much. So let's right. read through this and then see um, what works, what, you know. But um, I thank you, Dana. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I think, you know, both you and Diana point out the importance of communication. And I think balancing that information with levity and sort of just connection and community building, right? So um, really helpful. Um, Nicole and Stephanie, I'd love to hear from you sort of how your experience, you shared a little bit of what it's like in distance learning and what your classes are like, but are there ways that it feels different now or that you are learning different skills that you maybe didn't realize you had or needed um, and particularly you know, we are talking about social emotional learning here. So thinking about empathy and resilience and relationship building, are those the kinds of things you feel like you're learning and practicing now? Um, so Nicole, do you wanna start? You look like you had an idea. Yeah, I had an idea. Okay, so okay, so this was actually something that I was struggling with in the middle of quarantine so far. Mm -hmm. It was like the idea of formality when you're referring to teachers when you need help with mm -hmm. something. So I, okay, I'm not that shy of a student. I'm like, I'm pretty extroverted, you know? I like to go out and talk, but I, I feel like sometimes asking a question that you don't know if it's like a valid question, so you kind of hesitate to ask. Mm -hmm. I don't know, there's, a, there's just a fear of not having a right question to ask. So that was something that I was struggling with until like I was talking to my older sister, Michelle. She's a senior and 
she kind of knows how to navigate through that. So she kind mm -hmm. of helped me out and was like, oh, it's like, it's not that big of a deal. Just pretend like you're in school and pretend like you're in this setting. And when you're sending an email, like be formal and respectful always, but you can always be casual too. Like it doesn't have to be like you're messaging a president. <laughs> Right. Okay. That is such a good example. I hadn't thought about that. Just sort of, you have to change the way you ask questions and interact with your teachers now that you're in this virtual environment. That's really good learning and a good point. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. Thank you. Stephanie, did anything come to mind for you? Yeah. Uh, personally, for me, I'm more of an introvert. Mm -hmm. But ever since uh, this whole quarantine happened, I find myself emailing teachers mostly every week. I usually have questions and I, keep spamming them and sometimes they don't answer me back because I'm pretty sure they're tired. <laughs> uh, and I kind of distance myself from my friends, but uh, I started picking up a hobby of writing letters. So I kind of want to mail letters to my friends in order to stay connected. And hopefully I can write a letter to my teachers. Like maybe I'm going to school tomorrow to pick up my things. So mm -hmm. I hope to like leave a letter in the front office so that way they can give it to the teacher as a thank you note. Love that. Wow. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Well, I, um, it's, it's go ahead, Beth. to have to cut this part of the conversation short because I could listen to students and parents talk about their experience forever. Um, but we, we do have to move on to the next segment. Um, it, it hurts to be the moderator right now. I want to shut this down. <laughs> this down but um stephanie diana nicole and dina thank you so much um for being visible and audible they are not going away folks um they're going to remove themselves from the video but they're still going to be available in the chat so if you have questions please continue to ask them um they will be responding to them in writing uh thank you all and give them some love thank you all so much for joining us today and being a part of this session, it's so critical that we hear these voices about uh, social emotional learning and how we're all just dealing with this and trying to trying to um, continue learning and stay a part of a community during this time. Um, I'm going to ask you at this time to to practice what we practiced earlier um, and step over to the chat section of this and for our teachers to step onto the audible and visible section of this. All right. Session. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so teachers, I am excited to um, to introduce and, and uh, once you're all on here, um, go ahead and give a wave as I say your names. I'm excited to introduce Hanifa Miles, teacher of from Discovery Charter School in Newark, Tori Lojek, teacher from South Fayette Intermediate School in Pittsburgh. Mary Lully, teacher from PS17 Henry David Thoreau School in New York City. And Renee Vai, teacher, is among her many titles at Josephine Academy of the Sacred Heart here in Chicago. So, um, you know, I don't see Renee and Mary yet. Um, Renee and Mary, if you need to refresh in order to be able to join. Oh, there we go. Here we go, Renee. Welcome. And we are looking for Mary. Um, but Karen, why don't you go ahead and get started? Okay. If you're right. Great. Um, so similarly, I think <laughs> we'll start by each of you introducing yourselves and sharing a little bit about, you know, one of our core questions is how are we continuing to build a sense of classroom community? when we're not in our physical classrooms, right? So, Anifa, do you mind getting us started with telling us a little bit about yourself and how you're thinking about that? Sure, no problem. I'm Hanifa Miles from Discovery Charter School. Um, we're a small school community, about 110 students. Um, so we're really close to it, um, in essence. And we decided that we would develop a homeroom time that was a non-work in a work period time where we could connect with our students to um, just check in on them, uh, ask them how they're spending their time at home, ask them about some hobbies or interests that they developed at home, um, play some games, uh, play some typing games, just to you know bring back that 
feeling of um, community by seeing each other interacting in a non-work way. Um, we've also uh, created some breakout rooms for our kids so that they can see each other and talk to each other because a lot of our kids, they don't, they don't live close. Um, some of them are not on social media, they don't have phones. So it was really important for us to um, establish some group time so that our kids can um, check in on each other and just uh, have that peer-to-peer -peer interaction. We've also developed uh, some work, uh, no, some office hours where our kids can come in and just see us to maybe have a virtual lunch, to uh, check in on their progress, you know, just to drop by to ask questions to hang out. It was really important that we made sure that we were visible throughout the school day online so our kids can uh, get that human interaction. Thank you. I love that you're thinking about the adult to student connection and the student to student connection as well, right? Thank you. Great examples. Love the virtual lunch. Um, Tori, do you want to share a little bit about yourself and how you're thinking about that? Sure. So, um, hi, everybody. My name is Tori Lojack. I teach STEAM for grades three, four, and five in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, I share about 800 students with my um, partner, Samantha Edkin. She's in our audience today. And we um, decided to kind of work together for this online learning journey. So we um, both have our own classrooms in the physical school. But for virtual school, we kind of teamed up together and we figured, you know, um, working together, two people would give our students at least one teacher always accessible. So um, one of the things that we did is we kind of adopted each other's classrooms and we interact with all the kids um, in our building, even if they weren't specifically in our physical space. Um, our school started out by doing asynchronous learning where we just posted assignments and the kids had um, the rest of the week to you know, turn them in. And then something that you know, our school realized is that that kind of takes away from some of the human interaction. So they wanted us to start piloting synchronous learning. So um, Samantha and I hopped on that pilot and we had our first synchronous meeting with students um, last Friday and we really um, enjoyed it. And I think the kids really enjoyed the opportunity to talk to each other. And we, they were very like attentive and they were very in, engaged in the lesson. And at the end, we just said, is there anything you guys wanna talk about? And the kids were like, can we just share what we're doing this weekend? Like they just wanted to have conversations. So Samantha and I just kind of sat on um, the Zoom call and we let the students interact. And they just had, we were just so impressed with their etiquette with each other. Like it was like we were in school, but you know, they were waiting for on a turn to talk. They would unmute and mute their microphone. So I think that one of the things that, um, you know, I've learned from this experience is that our students really, you know, went above and beyond um, what we could have ever imagined and something, you know, so unprecedented with this. Thank you, Tori. That's great to hear. Um, yeah, it's inspiring to hear how you're shifting and innovating in such a short period of time. So thank you. Um, Mary, do you want to share your thoughts? Hi, I'm Mary Lulai. I'm from PS17 in Queens, um, along with Dina and Diana, who we had um, on the parent panel. Um, we, I mean, they covered a lot of what we've kind of been doing as a school community. Um, as a teacher, I'm an intervention teacher. So I work with a wide range of students, grades K to five. Um, and it's just kind of been trying to establish that outreach to families still. Um, as of this week, I'm still adding kids onto my caseload um, and setting up. I had started with group sessions, um, but as a lot of people have said, a lot of students kind of need that face-to-face -face and sometimes that one-on-one -on -one interaction for the time being. Um, my goal with them is to teach them reading and writing, but most of my sessions have been them telling me about what they ate when they woke up in the morning, what they're planning to eat as soon as we get off of our video chat. Um, and I, I've kind of resigned myself to the fact that if that's what they need right now, that's what I can be for them. Um, you know, we'll read books when we can, we'll do some writing assignments together when we can, but if that day all they need is somebody to talk to, then that's what we're gonna do. Um, I have put together some group sessions of students who just said, I want to see my friends. Can you invite them into the session next time? Um, so it's just kind of been trying to get them together and providing that emotional support. Um, you know, when we get back into the school building, whenever that is, 
on the reading and the writing for right now. I, I think it's difficult for a lot of them to focus on that when their mind is so many other places. Um, because I'm an out of classroom teacher, I've had the opportunity to kind of work with the school as a whole on a lot of things. Um, as Dina had mentioned, we started a spirit team once we shifted to remote learning. And we've been doing school spirit days on a weekly basis. Families have loved getting dressed up, doing videos, um, sending, I had sent out a dance challenge similar to the TikTok challenges that are out there right now. Families sent in videos, said they spent the whole week practicing together. So just trying to send out different things for um, the families to do to give them something other than sitting in front of a computer. Um, and I know a lot of families, it's a lot of arguments right now about get your work done, get your work done, mm -hmm. um, while parents are at home working too. So we're just trying to give those opportunities for something fun in the midst of what isn't such a fun time for everybody. Thank you, Mary. And I think the research would back you up to say that you know, the school connectedness and the social emotional support is going to be the thing that boosts the academic learning ultimately. So absolutely. Um, thank you. Renee, welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself and share how you're thinking about the community building aspect of your classroom? Yes, absolutely. My name is Renee Vi. I'm from Josephina Academy in Chicago. Uh, we are a small private school, all female. You met two of them in the last session, Nicole and Stephanie. Um, so we have, yeah, we have about 160 uh, amazing uh, young ladies at our school, um, which is is beneficial to have a small, tight knit community. I feel like in this time, as a teacher, I. It, I wear lots of hats, as you may have read in the in the chats, but um, I'm I'm the director of curriculum and programs. I'm also a teacher, which again is is strange for uh, but private school, small private school, it works. Um, so I am directly impacted by the policies that my team, my admin team, and I create, especially learning. Um, so the biggest impact for me as a teacher has been project-based learning um, in times of digital learning. It's been a game changer, especially with uh, high school students who have a lot on their minds and uh, who are, uh, we, we have asynchronous learning as well, mainly because um, we found that it wasn't quite equitable to um, assign our students to be online at specific times because a lot of them are at home now taking care of the home, taking care of siblings, helping siblings do schoolwork, uh, especially younger siblings. So we're asynchronous. So project-based learning for me, um, completely flipping my class to that has really, I feel like, helped me engage my students in their learning a little bit more they're not as easily distracted because every single thing that they complete in the class is working towards this, this mm -hmm. end goal. Specifically, um, it's a business class, so they're actually creating their own business. Um, and I've eliminated all assignments that aren't building towards that end goal. It's also, um, I've also um, flipped it to mastery. So I don't take off late points. Um, I give them feedback on uh, every step of the way and uh, they go back and they can revise and they can earn more points based on uh, the standards that they're trying to master. So it for me and I teach sophomores. So for me, I, I feel like um, my engagement has um, not suffered quite as much as maybe other classes um, because, again, they're very goal oriented and focused and it's fun too. It's, it's something that they, they're creating something that they want to create, um, mm -hmm. and that they're passionate about. Thank you, Renee. And tons of social emotional yeah. competencies built, being built through problem-based learning, project-based learning as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And I think particularly important for people to hear that piece about engagement when so many folks are worried about disengaged students that the actual content of your teaching can help with that, right? Um, so I'd love to hear from anyone else too about, we heard about morning meetings and project-based learning and some innovative ways of thinking of team teaching. Are there other innovations you all are exploring now in this sort of unprecedented moment for you as teachers? I 
I can uh, jump in real quick and say that my, <laughs> I thought that I knew a lot of um, different websites and resources uh, for classes. And, and I, I mean, I think I've, I've tripled the amount of resources um, that I've learned about in this time. So uh, a really cool one that my, the students were just talking about, that's a game changer. Yeah. Highly recommend Flipgrid. It's kind of a way to interact without physically being in the same area at the same time. But also Padlet mm -hmm. um, is a great resource. Uh, it kind of allows you to create these completely different digital collages. So an entire class or an entire community can come together. They can post videos, they can post pictures, they can post whatever it is that you the information you want them to gather and collect. Um, so I would definitely check out those two resources if if you haven't yet. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to jump okay. in. Um, I don't Mary. Jump in. Go um, ahead, Mary. Oh, Hanifa, let's let's have Mary and then Hanifa. So two that we two resources that our school has really started to um, jump on board with attending PDs and trying out with our students are Jamboard and uh, Pear Deck. We're using Google Classroom as a, really as a, the entire DOE for the most part. Um, but across our school, we're using Google Classroom. And those are two things that um, align with like the Google platform. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing we did find at the beginning was there's so many resources out there, but so many things require um, separate logins. So as many things as we could automatically connect into the Google Classroom. That was kind of the direction we went with our resources. Um, Jamboard, for anybody who's not familiar with it, it is kind of like a large bulletin board that students can put post-its on um, digitally, obviously. Um, and so they can put different color post-its, they can write in different fonts. And so teachers have been using that as kind of a wrap up for their mini lessons. So they'll do uh, either a live mini lesson or a video one, and they will have students post a post-it on Jamboard as like their exit ticket. Um, Pear Deck also, uh, it links right up with Google Slides and it makes them interactive for the kids. So there mm -hmm. you can create, it creates a separate one for each of the students. They can answer the questions right on it. There's sliding scales that they can use to rate different things on Pear Deck. Um, and so it's just a good way to kind of get those lessons out to kids that we would have done anyway, um, but making it more interactive for them. You can add voice, uh, they can have the entire slideshow read to them. Um, so just a lot of, a, a resource that adds a lot of those uh, various levels for kids who need it. That's great, and it humanizes yeah. it a little bit too. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Hanifa, did you wanna jump in? Yes, um, we too at Discovery have been using Jamboard, um, oh, right. Storm uh, Board. We've had our children um, create little story scenes of uh, written work. Um, it comes with pictures, they can add in a little audio, a little video. Um, so it's a nice way to bring their writing to life. Um, it's really interactive, they can do it together as a group. It's great for brainstorming and answering questions so that kids are just not hearing us talk to them um, via video, it's uh, really interactive and that's been working. We've also decided to um, utilize Google Docs more and not just a regular word form doc. We've been working with slides. So we'll put um, worksheets on slides, uh, teaching our kids just how to be a little bit more tech savvy, um, change up the way we present information so that um, it's visually pleasing to the students and they just don't get uh, tired of seeing the same format uh, for every subject, for every assignment. Great. Thank you. Incredibly helpful resources as this is new territory for everyone. Beth, do we have time for one more question or? One more. Okay. <laughs> so I think one thing I'd be curious to hear is, um, you know, in the country, there's a lot of conversation around adult SEL needs and how do we support adult SEL, particularly as um, our teachers and other staff members are under incredible strain and as well. So I'm curious what your school leaders or what your district is doing that you're finding really helpful at this moment. 
So go ahead, Mary. Our school counselor has been absolutely amazing in not only coming up with um, resources for the students and the families, but also, you know, making sure to address that teachers are also going through the same time as everybody else right now. Um, so we have had whole staff yoga classes that all everybody on staff was invited to join in. Um, a local yoga instructor uh, donated a few Zoom classes that she did for free. Um, we also have a mental health consultant through the DOE um, who had been doing PDs for us throughout the year on how to support students in trauma um, and in crisis times. And so the school counselor has been in communication with our mental health consultant on bringing that same work to the teacher level. Um, so they're holding meetings, they're holding different meditation seminars and um, sessions for just the staff and teachers to participate in. While they're also planning things like that for the families and the community, there's separate ones that are just for teachers and staff. Thank you, Mary. Okay, I again. I was sorry about that. No, Tori, I wish I wish this could go on forever, but um, but we are we are at that point in the conversation where we need to bring our school leaders on. So um, thank you so much. A uh, huge shout out to our teachers. Um, our teachers are going to stick around and they will be available in the chat if anybody has any additional questions um, or thoughts for them. Um, uh, please uh, give our teachers a huge thank you for joining us today and for sharing so many of those resources. I tried to link to as many as I possibly could. And um, they're also going to stick around for our Q&A at the end. So teachers, thank you so much. Um, please, at this time, uh, thank you. Um, and, and stick with us here. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> and at this time, I'm going to ask you. our principals to step on. Um, and I'm going to take a moment to introduce each of you. So we have um, Colleen Schrantz, the principal of Josephina Academy of the Sacred Heart here in Chicago. Denise Kritanan of Discovery Charter School in Newark. Um, and my great friend and the writer of the article that set all of this off, um, Seth Lavin, the principal of Brentano Elementary School here in Chicago. Um, so go ahead and- Welcome. Thank you. I think Denise is still trying to get on, but hopefully we'll be with us soon. So maybe if we could all just take a moment to introduce yourself, your school, and how you're thinking differently or building upon what you are already doing around social emotional learning in your school. Um, so Seth, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, you can hear me. Can I get like a nonverbal cue? Yeah, there you go. Um, my name is Seth Lavin. Uh, I'm the principal of Brentano School, which is a Chicago neighborhood school in CPS. Um, I'm also a parent. My kids go to the school. Uh, how am I thinking differently? I mean, I'm thinking about everything very differently. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that like one of the first things that was happening in my brain which prompted me to have all these conversations with Beth and, and, and write that piece was, was sort of like saying out loud that this is a disaster. Um, and, I, and I felt like in the beginning, it was just sort of attempt to just normalize that we could all go online and kids could keep learning and teachers could keep teaching. And, and, I, and I just felt like that was crazy. And I wanted to just say out loud, like, this isn't, this isn't a plan. It's not a transition. It's a disaster. We're living in a disaster. Mm -hmm. And after disaster, I'm like, let's, let's use that as the frame and give ourselves space to have grief and, and all the things associated with that. That's, that's big on them. Thank you, Seth. Colleen, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Colleen. I'm the principal of Rojo's Kingdom Academy of the Sacred Heart. Um, my teacher and uh, two of my students were on in previous segments. Um, kind of similar to Seth, I think it's an interesting time where, um, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world and we can, we can, we can, we don't have the answers and we can, we can be vulnerable and we can tell people that we don't really know what's going to happen, but it, it kind of gives us equity amongst the playing field. And so, you know, it's been really challenging um, be, to, to uh, continue the community. We, we are a small school, we're 160 girls, and uh, we pride ourselves on that. And without the school, 
Um, how do we keep that up? And so we have an amazing team, uh, a campus minister who's built a prayer wall, um, a student life coordinator who brings challenges to the girls every day. Um, we, we did some, some teacher challenges, like um, cook your favorite meal, share it. Um, what's an interesting article you've read? Um, just kind of trying to connect and build that community. We, uh, we meet once a week. Um, uh, once a week we have yoga or happy hour together with the teachers. Um, and so I really think um, we've also had an opportunity to be able to meet some foundational needs and, some, and bring some food to our community. We have a, a really great donor who's been able to connect a local restaurant um, with the families in our community and we serve them every Friday. So that's been a lot of fun to be able to be out there in the community still. Um, but we, uh, my biggest concern is the teachers, right? And, and how do we move on um, and, and thinking about their needs and homeschooling and keeping up with the students and being that rock for, for all of our kids. But uh, I think we've all learned a lot about, we've been kind of thrown into this 21st century reality where I think a lot of us saw it coming. We never knew how soon. Um, so we've learned these adaptive skills and, and to be flexible. And I think um, it's really showing um, showing our students and showing everybody else how we're kind of learning and growing together and figuring it out together. And I think um, that's one of the neat platforms we can use in our favor. Thank you, Kelly. Denise, did you want to share a little bit of introduction about your school and what you're thinking is right now? So uh, I'm uh, from the same school as uh, Anifa in Newark, a uh, very small school. And uh, so um, there are maybe two things uh, I want to share is um, we have a tradition in the school uh, of sharing a book that we read all at the same time, all the kids from fourth to eighth grade. And uh, just before we went into confinement, we were reading uh, Brown Girl Dreaming. And, you know, we switched to make it uh, to put it online to allow the kids to uh, annotate the book and respond and kind of felt that the kids had a hard time to connect and in the beginnings they were missing a day here and there and kind of lost the flow and so it's after like almost two weeks we said all right we've got to change uh, and so we decided to uh, every week to take a new theme and uh, we divided into different teams of teacher and we decided to have a curriculum that really respond to what the kids are feeling and kind of help them make sense of uh, things that are happening uh, around them. And so, for example, you know, at the beginning, the kids would say, uh, well, I, I want to come back to school. I don't like it. And our response was, say, all right, in every bad situation, there is a silver lining. And our first week unit was the silver lining playbook. And... Uh, the second week, uh, you know, the, the issue is that a lot of kids don't show themselves on camera and there's all kind of reason for the kids not to want to. But one of the reasons is they can't have their hair done. And so for one week, the theme was hair. We started with, uh, you know, the Oscar uh, winning short called Hair Love. And uh, we read article about you know, what's professional or not professional and discrimination around hair. And we ended the week with an assembly uh, with a friend of a teacher who posts a YouTube video about hair care. And the kids were asking her a question about hair and identity. And we continued like that every week to uh, basically try to answer uh, what the kids are asking and what they're expressing about their lives. So that was uh, one move we made. And the other move was for me uh, as the principal of the school to say, how are we not gonna be too isolated? Because we know that teaching can be isolated in regular life when we're alone in our classroom. And now we're alone in front of a screen teaching. And so from the beginning, we made the choice, all right, we're gonna meet every day. And uh, in this daily uh, meeting, we have, kind of three components that we play with. One is checking in. And checking in sometimes start just from, you know, informal conversation when we get in the room. And sometimes it's asking questions about, you know, 
how the technology has played with us today and how a child has taken control of a Zoom room we were in. <laughs> and sometimes it's just uh, sharing what the kids are learning and responding. The second component of this daily meeting is um, to get better at teaching online because we all have to learn very quickly. So we spend time on that. And the third thing is to plan curriculum together. And the silver lining for us teachers being that we've actually been able to spend more time as a team planning because, uh, because we have to in a way. And I think we're going to gain a lot in our team from that. Thank you, Denise. Hugely impactful sharing. And I see even how you've created new norms, it looks like, for your staff, um, which is certainly part of what we would consider a social emotional learning environment, right? Um, and shifted the teaching to be responsive to the moment and be culturally responsive. So thank you for that. Are there other examples folks would want to share of sort of how you're using this moment to impact the both the content of the teaching and learning and the ways that you're supporting teaching and learning in your schools? Um, I, I'm going to jump in. Early on, we uh, there was two things that we noticed um, really quickly is that um, teachers and students were having um, finding hard time balancing. There was a lot more uh, work they were doing on the, uh, the preparation end. Um, and so we quickly moved our schedule um, to do uh, to form four actual school days and the fifth being more of a conference check-in day, um, giving the students and the teachers some flexibility in their week-long schedule, um, but then also gave the, the, the teachers and students the time they needed to check in with each other. And we also knew that the longer we were going to be in isolation and the longer we're going to be in quarantine, um, that our grading scale would have to be a little more flexible. And so We've um, built some policies around, um, um, it's, it's kind of like uh, we have some base grades and then um, essentially fourth quarter is kind of like pass and fail. And so um, if they do worse than where they are at, they will receive their base grade. They just can't fail at this point, which gives them a little more room from the curriculum to deal with any social emotional issues they're dealing with. Um, we, we do have a pretty strong referral program right now in a system that works through our counseling department. Um, and so the counselors, myself and uh, our dean of students are, are regularly checking in with um, students. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, Seth, did you want to jump in on this? Sure, sure. I, I think that one of the first conversations we had uh, was reframing the mission of school, uh, mm -hmm. acknowledging and saying out loud that the mission has changed. You know, when we come to school in the beginning of the year, we say, among many other things that we're going to do, that we're going to take the students where they are and we're going to, we're going to give them what they need to grow and we hold ourselves accountable for that um, in lots of different ways, for good and for worse. But that's just not the mission now. Um, the mission now isn't academic growth. That, that's not the purpose of school right now. Uh, and so the, the purpose of school is connection, like causing students to still have their community. Um, and, and I reflect every day on how profound that is. I mean, I'm an adult. I have so many text messages, conversations occurring simultaneously. I'm here speaking with you all. I, I think about my two sons. They're nine and six. They're students in my school. And I think, who do they? Who do they interact with each day besides each other? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is the people in their school because their teachers create a space in which that occurs. And my, my kids are privileged in a million different ways, but the, the importance of that from a mental health standpoint and from just a, an experience of childhood and human life standpoint is, is, um, is, is, is incomparable. And so I think that teachers, there's a lot of stuff being put on teachers right now to still move kids forward academically. And so I thought that my most important job as principal was to say, don't do that. That's not mm. the point. Um, and mm. I'll just send anybody who tells you that is the point. Don't don't get on Instagram and look at teachers who are doing that because uh, it isn't the point. That leaves kids behind. So that, was, that was a critical reframing. Um, and then to think about the academic work that we're doing as the offerings, that's the language that we use. Like 
these aren't assignments in the sense that we're assigning you to do them or that we're telling you what to do with your time. We're making an offering to you. Meet us here. Uh, think about this. Do this if you can. But it's an offering. It's not a task. I think that uh, as Colin and say, say, what's interesting is we have to rethink each time what makes the most sense. And uh, you spoke about grading, Colin, and it's what makes sense. And uh, for example, uh, we were supposed to uh, publish a progress note like uh, 10 days ago. And I'm like, makes no sense to publish what I was going to publish. So we created something new where I said, what questions do the parents have actually? And for me, one question was, are the kids coming to the class? Are the kids participating? Uh, as a submitting work and as a submitting meaningful work. And that's what our progress not was, is answering these four questions. But it's also, what's going to be the meaning of any kind of assessment? What do we want to assess? What's our priority? And uh, it goes all over because, you know, I have a, a mother who calls me and say, I'm so panicked because I don't know if my daughter is going to get any education this year. And she's on the side of pushing us to 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 you know require a lot of accountability from the kids and other parents who call you and say it's too much it's too much it's too much and and they're both right uh, but it's just that the situation are very different and so we but the chance is that we don't have to worry as much now about what needs to be done what should be done but really what makes sense right now and I think it's it's our chance is uh, we can redesign things to respond to the expectation of the parents, the expectation of the kids, and also to make it sustainable for the teachers. Because uh, Ms. Miles, who was on the panel, you know, she has a kid like many teachers have, like says you do, and we have to make sure that whatever we design is sustainable for everyone. Thank you. I think you are absolutely right that this is a moment to pause and question and make sure everything we do is grounded in the values we have and to look at those values for each of our schools, right? Um, thank you for that. And thank you for the incredible work you're doing and the leaders that you are. Beth, I know we wanted to yeah. open it up to some questions and answers. Absolutely. So, so we want to give, um, you know, we've got 50 people with us in this session. Um, I want to give uh, all of us a chance to, to engage in the Q&A. So, our school leaders are going to stay with us. They're going to stay audible and visible. Um, but our teachers, our students, and our parents are also still with us in the chat. So any questions that anyone has, please uh, put them in the chat. Karen is watching, um, and she'll bring those questions to our school leaders. Um, she'll repeat them aloud to our teachers, students, and parents. Um, and, and we'll go ahead and get those answered. And if we don't have any questions, then um, if Karen has additional questions, she can ask them. Perfect. Yeah. Just looking. Um, so one question, I guess, while we're waiting for audience questions is just sort of for you all as school leaders and principals, what's supporting you? Or what are, where are you finding um, support from organizations, your district, your the world at large, um, how and how can those on this pan, um, in our session think more about that as well? Um, so for me, it's, it's been imp uh, on top of it. And I've been a teacher at my school for 15 years, but it's my first year as principal. So you can imagine it's quite an education for me. Um, I, it's important for me to go on a lot of I mean, webinars now, but you no, know, in other places where other school uh, leaders share what they do, and especially places where we are transparent. Uh, because on one hand, we all have to kind of sell what we do. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, it's, it's important to find places where you can say, wow, we're struggling so much with the engagement of the kids. We're struggling so much to find the kids and bring them to the Zoom. Uh, so, Find places where it's transparent is important for me. And uh, also find uh, places, I'm, I'm lucky to be connected to Bank Street College where uh, I had my master and being able to to uh, be in this network and learn from other people and 
there has been really important for me. Thank you, Denny. I have put a question in there, but I'm just going to yeah, say because I'm audible. Um, how do you handle this tension between the fact that that you all realize and so many of us realize that things have changed and priorities have a need to change? And there are probably a lot of parents who, who haven't made that shift yet and are um, still right there on academics and want that to be the focus and want teachers to be teaching full time. Um, and, and don't yet realize that this is an equity issue and, and maybe their child is not impacted the way so many other people How do you handle that, the communication and, and how do you help people to understand that that shift has happened and that you have to react to it appropriately for all students? Um, I, I can jump in on that. Um, I think that like a, a framing, you know, I use the word disaster before. And I'm not from New Orleans. I didn't live through it. I don't. I don't make that comparison lightly, and I don't mean to minimize anybody's experience in Hurricane Katrina. But that I've said, uh, this, is, this is Katrina. This is Katrina. Asked. This is a disaster. This is people displaced. Um, it's it's an emergency. It's a crisis. So I, I sort of. In fact, all those things, you know, those of us who didn't live in New Orleans read about different ways that people supported those around them in that time. And, and I think a little bit like, you know, what, what do you wish you had done if you had been there? It's like in an emergency, who, who do you want to be? And then I just sort of try to be that person or urge others to. And so this answers a couple of the questions. I think people have this, our school system these days is very fear driven. Students are afraid of teachers, teachers are afraid of principals, principals are afraid of districts, districts are afraid of test scores. Uh, and that's bad, you know, each of those um, fear relationships results in, in bad things for, for both groups. Um, and I think people right now at this principal level um, and probably at the teacher level and parent level, they sort of look to their left and right and like, what am I supposed to do? Who's, who's telling me what to do? And it's like, nobody's telling you what to do. Um, everybody's, everybody's abandoned their post. I mean, this is a disaster. Like, the, the directive you're going to get from your district today will be changed six hours from now, I promise. Um, and so that's terrifying for some people. It can also be a little bit liberating. Um, and so going back to like, what do we say to parents who don't get it? Is I just sort of, I just say the truth. Um, you know, when they say, why are teachers teaching all day? I say, because that would be bad for kids and for teachers. Um, and people sometimes get mad, but, but you, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a moment where you should feel free to do just what's right because all the people that may be staring away of that at other times don't exist right now. And so just, just tell people the truth. I mean, I think, I think it goes back to that, like, start with the why. And like, if this is what we believe and this, this, is, this is what we build our beliefs and our mission off of. And you have to have trust in the leader and say, like, this is where, um, where the shift is and we're reframing this to, to look like such. Um, and I think if you start with that why, and if you um, explain where you're coming from, and like I saw it pop up, Dina had a good point about like having a conversation, open up, opening yourself up about having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation about uh, and reaching a mutual understanding. I think a lot of people just want to hear, feel heard, but I mean, um, if you have that trusted relationship and build everything off of, of your why, I think people kind of understand then, or you build some understanding around it. From, I read an article in New York Times early on that said, um, I think it was from a general, General Mike Crystal, if I remember his name, said in situation like this, uh, what was it? Uh, be, be visible, be transparent and be flexible. And mm -hmm. actually I've used that quite a bit. And being visible means being very accessible to parents, kids, and teachers all the time. Be transparent is, as you said, says is, let's not pretend we have a plan for everything if we don't. And be flexible for me, he said, what is it that we want? So, and in our communication with parents, we always say, how can we help? Instead of saying, yeah, your child is not coming on Zoom or them telling us uh, you're not doing what I want. It's like, okay, what is it that you want and how can we help, how can we help? And I think when we start the conversation this way, uh, we find solutions. 
Yeah. Diana posed a good question, I think, in the chat around, you know, how do we, I think we've, for some folks, awoken to the need to tend to the social emotional wellness of our students and our teachers and to build those competencies, but how do we not lose that when we go back to whatever school looks like in the fall? And I'd love to hear what people think about that. Well, I, I think we won't. <laughs> and uh, I mean, one of the reasons is it's very likely that in September we can't anyway. So I mean, in uh, like 10 days ago at Discovery, the whole staff is starting a, a, a planning process where we're planning for what we call hybrid discovery, <laughs> where we, we imagine we won't know who's in school, how many, and, and so we have to, to cater to both at home and in school at the same time. And if we do that, we can't do anything the same way we used to. Uh, but it, I think it's a fantastic chance. I mean, if you just go back to the grading, as Colleen mentioned, it's we've we've been so stuck for decades in you know the way we grade, and and it's a whole system where we, we're taken in and we have to follow it in, to some degrees to you know to fit. And here we it won't work. And so we really have a chance to say, well, what do we want to evaluate? What feedback do we want to give? How do we get the kids to, to buy in and take charge of their education? Um, I, I agree. Somebody said it was hard to he hear me. Um, I don't know how to solve that except by talking louder. <laughs> um, uh, like, going to that fear thing that Beth typed in there, I mean, all of the mechanisms that make people do these sort of dumb things in schools having to do with testing and grading and prioritization of stuff that's fictitious, this is a moment when we can break free of that because the entire architecture of that accountability system is, is broken. Like they can't rate our schools next year. You know, they can't, People are going to try, like they're going to try to make you give pretests to your kids on computers in the fall, and that. But like that's, it's all going to fall apart. I mean, there's no way for that stuff to work. And so it is this moment where, if we want to, we can say you can't even judge us by our scores and try to influence our behavior that way because it will be impossible. What is a third grader's average growth going to be next year? What is a third grader anymore? You know, like none of it, none of it makes any sense. And so. The opening is right now to reinvent how we uh, make decisions in schools uh, because the way those decisions have been made for many schools won't work next year. Whether we'll step into that opening or not, I don't know. Uh, absolutely. And and as I've said before, and I, I, I feel it this time, the last thing I want to do is, is put an end to this conversation because, like I said, I could go on forever um, listening to these brilliant people talk about this critical topic. Um, but sadly, uh, we, do, we do have to call an end to this session. Um, say a huge thank you and, and please uh, share your thanks in the chat um, to Seth, Denise, Colleen, Renee, Mary, Tori, Hanifa, Diana, Dina, Nicole, Stephanie, and most importantly, to Karen Van Osdell and the wonderful people at Castle who have spent the past two decades dedicating themselves to the, the founding and study and, um, and you know, integration of social emotional learning into academics. Um, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be where we are now um, when it comes to social emotional learning. And so we, uh, as, a, as a nation, owe them a debt of gratitude and schools that can certainly does today as well.